notebook. It makes me very depressed. If I go out, I like to ride a bicycle. So I rode my bicycle to the mall, and I like to look at the people. Even though it's a small snapshot of suburban white middle America, it's still a snapshot of America. As a talk show host, you're basically living in your own world like a painter, truthfully, or anyone who works at home alone. If you don't see people, you can go out of your mind. You can go crazy, and you can start to distort reality. So I go to this place. I try to go once a day to one mall or another or walk the streets of San Francisco. i got to see people or I go nuts. So I see a woman go by with two beautiful children. They must have been a year old in the car, a double carriage. So I stopped and I said to her, oh, are they twins? I didn't even think, should I say it or not say it? Because you live in an age where if you say to someone, are they twins, they can call the police and say, you're, you're something wrong with them. He stopped me and asked me if they're twins. So I didn't even think. They were so beautiful. I stopped and I said, oh, are they twins? And she said yes, and she was so happy to tell me their names, Anastasia and Joey, a boy and a girl. You know what I said to her? You're a very lucky woman. And then as I walked on, I thought about something. When I was a kid, again, when I was a kid, people would stop women with babies and admire the babies and look at them and talk about them. And the mother felt good. You know, it's very hard being a young mother. It's one of the hardest things on earth. Their bodies have changed. They, uh, other than the supermodel who gained four ounces after pregnancy, most women's bodies get wrecked from, from, from pregnancy. So a woman goes through hell uh, during pregnancy and afterwards. Believe me. So I didn't do it for the woman. I did it because I was stopped. The children were amazingly interesting and beautiful. But I thought about what a glow I gave this stranger who I didn't even know. And I thought what a world it could be if people were just human to each other and didn't want something. You know, ah, eh, whatever. Savage. Another year over And you won't just be gone a professor stood before his philosophy class and had some items in front of him. When the class began, he wordlessly picked up a very large and empty mayonnaise jar and proceeded to fill it with golf balls. He then asked the students if the jar was full. The students said it was full. The professor then picked up a box of pebbles and poured them into the jar. He shook the jar lightly. The pebbles rolled into the open areas between the golf balls. He then asked the students again if the jar was full. They agreed it was. The professor then picked up a box of sand and poured it into the jar. Of course, the sand filled up everything else. He asked once more if the jar was full. The students responded with a unanimous yes. The professor then produced two beers from under the table and poured the entire contents into the jar, effectively filling the empty space between the sand. The students laughed. Now, said the professor, as the laughter subsided, I want you to recognize that this jar represents your life. The golf balls are the important things. Your family, your children, your health, your friends, and your favorite passions. And if everything else was lost and only they remained, your life would still be full. The pebbles are the other things that matter, like your job, your house, and your car. The sand is everything else, the small stuff. If you put the sand into the jar first, he continued, there is no room for the pebbles or the golf balls. The same goes for life. If you spend all your time and energy on the small stuff, you will never have room for the things that are important to you. Pay attention to the things that are critical to your happiness. Spend time with your children. Spend time with your parents. Visit with grandparents. Take your spouse out to dinner. Play another 18. There will always be time to clean the house and mow the lawn. Take care of the golf balls first. The things that really matter. Set your priorities. The rest is just sand. One of the students raised their hand and inquired what the beer represented. The professor smiled and said, I'm glad you asked. The beer just shows you that no matter how full your life may seem, there's always room for a couple of beers with a friend. I think it's beautiful. It's that simple. And, of course, it does put things in perspective as far as I am concerned, which is what I try to do on this show in my own way. I like my mama's food. It's so good to me. Her meatballs have with the spice. That make them a taste so nice. A little wine after we dine makes you feel so doggone a fine. My mama's a cooking. All right, welcome to a Savage Nation. Uh, we're talking about a food and a nutrition. Uh, and uh, I'm focusing on ethnic nutrition because many of us take pride in our ethnic background, as we should. And we eat what we think are ethnic meals. But in fact, I'm sorry to tell you, most of the ethnic meals that we're eating are not ethnic meals at all. Example, case in point, Italian food is not really Italian food uh, that the average Italian ate, let's say, 150 years ago in Italy. 
the Italian diet then was quite sparse. It might have been a whole grain spaghetti or a whole grain noodle on the farm with some vegetables with very little animal protein and perhaps some cheese products because they didn't kill the animal. But literally, they didn't slaughter the animal every time they ate a meal. And what you're eating is holiday meals three times a day, and you're getting the degenerative diseases uh, associated with uh, overly rich diets. It's the same with almost every other ethnic group on earth. And so you'd say Jewish food. Oh, I'm going to go to the deli and have a corned beef sandwich with a pickle. And that's not Jewish food. That is 19th century holiday Polish food. Jewish food is is uh, Yemenite food. You want to really eat Jewish food? Eat a Yemenite diet. That is the southern tip of the Arabian Peninsula. And what the Yemenites eat is what the ancient, Israel, the ancient Israelites probably ate. And that's why some of us wind up with diabetes and heart attacks so young because we're eating diets that we're not adapted to. Did you know this? You say, oh, come on, how do you know that? How do you know that? How do you know any of this stuff? Oh, well, I trust my, my, my doctor. He tells me to eat what I want and just take a Lipitor. And then if I get sick from uh, any food, just take something to digest it. That's all. And if that doesn't work, uh, they'll cut us open and remove something. All right, well, you can live that way if you want. You know what I'm saying? While the pig, the crow, the squid, and light creatures are forbidden, are forbidden by the Hebrew dietary laws, saturated fats, sucrose, and chemical additives are the unclean or forbidden foods in the etiology of internal health of rational man, I wrote. Page 138 of the Skeptical Nutritionist. I'm a genius. I really am. Boy, I was smart when I was young. That's really a good paragraph. Look at that one. Where the pig, the crow, the squid, and light creatures are forbidden by the Hebrew dietary laws, saturated fats, sucrose, and chemical additives are the unclean or forbidden in the etiology of internal health of rational man. That's really good stuff. And then I wrote, I support tradition, but urge my religious friends to eliminate dangerous components of their foods developed and introduced long after biblical laws were written. But it's like talking to yourself. You go to a Jewish group, they're, they're sticking their, they're, 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 they're eating Stella de Oro, a cake in their face every two minutes, a, a sweet, they wonder why they have diabetes, and they look so bad at 50, so many. I'm serious. They've lost all concept of diet. You can't live that way. It's impossible. Some can. It is true. Some people can eat anything. I call them nutritional rogues, by the way. These are the people who you say, oh, my grandfather lived to 104. You're full of crap, Savage, because he ate everything you just said he shouldn't eat, and he drank a bottle of scotch. I said, so he's a nutritional rogue. You try it. Get back to me when you're 50. See how long you last. Right? What else did I want to tell you about? I want to read your paragraph, introduction, why I am a skeptic. Oh, this is an interesting one. I quoted Galileo, who wrote, there is no scientific work that only one man can write. Now, that was written by Galileo in the Middle Ages. Listen to this, Al Gore, you schmuck. Al Gore, schmuck, and every other putz in the academic establishment who said that all the science is in on global warming. Schmucks, idiots. You don't even know what science means, you schmucks. Here's what Galileo wrote. Putz. There is no scientific work that only one man can write, schmuck. Galileo wrote that, but oh, Al Gore said oh, all the science is in on global warming. And then the idiots in the media said, all the science is in a global war. They're heretics. We know the earth is flat. And anyone who says the earth is round is not a scientist, said Al Gore. And then the schmucks on MSNBC snickered and went, yeah. <laughs> Introduction, why I'm a skeptic. Food is such a personal thing, and how anybody can dare suggest diets for others continually shocks me. And repugnant cuisine is scarcely the road to health and long life, I wrote in 1983. One more paragraph. Let's see. Hey, oh, this is good. Now, there are fine books on becoming vegetarian. Some of my closest friends are vegetarians. That's a joke. Yet we must not seek to declare as an objective truth that the plant world holds our major key to longevity. It may be true that George Bernard Shaw, Tolstoy Wagner, Shelley Byron Thoreau, and other illustrious figures were vegetable eaters, but so was Hitler. In fact, the German dictator's manic depressive mood swings and associated unexpected aggressive outbreaks might easily have been somewhat controlled with a good dose of high-quality protein and unrefined carbohydrates and with a steady intake of a good vitamin and mineral supplement on a regular basis. Better, Hitler should have gnawed on a big leg of lamb once a day and had a glass of wine. The well-known photo of Hitler and Eva Braun at Berchtesgaden with the maniac passed out in an armchair 
after eating lunch is not an image the hypoglycemically attuned researcher is likely to forget, I wrote. Diet and behavior vary in too many people for us to look for a simple set of rules as our salvation from too intense swings of mood. So, I mean, I wrote some nice stuff. You know, Hitler was a vegetarian and didn't drink either. And he was always starving. He could never get enough of anything because he was always hungry, so he invaded one country after another and killed too many people. As I said, if he ate a leg of lamb and had a drink once in a while, the whole course of history would have been altered. It's, it's absolutely true. The book was way ahead of its time. 1981, Macmillan Publishing, out of print. I still own the copyright, so don't rip it off. I think I'll reprint it now. Strategy for Designing a Nutritional Pro Program. As a night, it's a good book. Not for sale. Not for sale. And I want to tell you that the word food fascism, the phrase, I, I think I coined it on page six. Food fascism. I was against it then. The bookstores aligned with correct diets for the unmet mass of social engineers. You see, I was against them. And then I wrote, food fascism, like other varieties of the social disease, requires lieutenants to proselytize. Not wishing to participate in any form of totalitarianism, I wrote, I intend not to dictate a correct diet for a fictional reader. Now, if only Michelle Obama knew that. She dictates to you what you should eat, and then she eats ice cream in, in Martha's Vineyard. And you're not supposed to notice that. She came back eight pounds heavier. I mean, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The king has no clothes. We're living through it. Every day we see the victory garden that's outside the, the White House, and they grow your vegetables and eat good, and you're not eating right. They're going to arrest you if your child's obese, take them away from you. And every time they're on vacation, there they are in uh, Dearborn, Michigan, uh, uh, and they're eating ice cream cones. What the heck? Not good for you to eat like that. Not healthy at all. You know, practice what you preach, my friend. As I said to you, it all the roads go back to politics. They all come and go from politics. There's nothing more political than health and nutrition. Look what Obama did to the greatest me medical system in the world. So let me read you something that I remember hearing when I was a child. He who plays his fife and eats his way will live to fife another day. Now, what is that catchy rhyme mean he who plays his fife and eats his way will live to fife another day well it means that if you eat your way you're getting certain nutri nutrients which are life giving and longevity inducing what is whey it's the liquid remaining after the milk has been curdled and strained and turned into cheese there's a liquid that remains and it's usually discarded i believe now what's in the stuff that we throw out what the called whey well, it's rich in so many things, riboflavin, B12, magnesium, potassium, zinc, selenium. So he who plays his fife and eats his way will live to fife another day. It's the equivalent um, to eating whole grains as opposed to eating white bread. It's equivalent to eating uh, brown rice as opposed to eating white rice. You know, beriberi was rampant in Asia when they ate white rice until uh, they found out that all of the nutrients that were being thrown out in the husk of the rice were the nutrients required to prevent, for example, rickets. You, you know, that's an old thing you learned in high school, probably. I don't even know if they teach that anymore. Right now, they give you a pill instead. Everything they tell you to eat garbage, live like a lab rat, and, and take a pill. And then if you get sick, go to the quack and get six more pills. That's all. But those of us who actually studied foods and what's in them and want to know how to protect ourselves from disease have written books about it. So I remember, for example, there's another thing that's coming back to mind from my great book 20 30 years ahead of its time called the skeptical nutritionist and this was about another topic if only i could remember it I'm, I'm a little hungover frankly from a big dinner took the dog and i drank a lot of vodka i feel great don't get me wrong don't don't say it's hypocritical i believe in vodka the block but vodka is a health food if you you don't do it every night which i don't so there was a, a subject in here that i wanted to find Oh, oh, I remember. It's, um, yeah, it's fava bean hemolysis. I know that's not on everyone's lips. It's a disease we know nothing about. But I remember when I uncovered it, when I was writing this book, how many doctors wrote me who were ahead of their time. They said, oh, my God, Savage, how did you do this? Where did you find it? Well, I had just gotten my Ph.D. from the University of California, and I was very just fascinated by ethnic diets. And I studied every arcane piece of literature there was, and I came up with some interesting things. And so I found this about a fava beans. I, I've never eaten a fava bean ever ever since. Now, sometimes if I go in an Italian deli, you see fava beans, and they're fine if you're not, let us say, um, 
I shouldn't say allergic to them, but that's uh, close to what I'm about to tell you. There are individuals who do not understand